Thanks for watching. And today I want to solve a problem that I promised Black Pen Red Pen eight months ago that I would do. So this is it. Namely, I want to find the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared using four ways depending on your academic status. So I'll do it the high school way, then the college way, then the math major way, and finally the grad school way. So it's very, very cool. So let's start with the high school way. So high school, and again, imagine this was an exam out of 10 points, it would be one point. In that case, you would just use the fundamental theorem of calculus. Integral from one, 0 to 1 of x squared dx, an antiderivative is 1 third x cubed from 0 to 1, which would just be 1 third minus 0, which is 1 third. Great. But let's move on to more interesting stuff. So now let's do the college way. So suppose you take a college calculus course. In that case, you would use Riemann sums. So what are Riemann sums? Simply, you start with the interval 0 and 1, 0 to 1, and you have the function x squared. So your f of x equals x squared. And what you do, you first chop off 0, 1 into smaller intervals and of length, again, 1 over n for some n. And then what happens is, on each piece, you take the rectangle with height f of the right endpoint. So here, again, always take right, so like this. And then you get a bunch of fine rectangles. And the idea is, simply, you take the sum of the areas of the rectangles and let n go to infinity just to assure that they're fine. Because you're fine. All right. And then what is the integral in that case? So integral from 0 to 1 x squared dx. What this is, it's the limit as the width goes to infinity, as n goes to infinity, of width times the sum of heights. So 1 over n times sum from i from 1 to n. Again, 1 over n squared, 2 over n squared, 3 over n squared, up to n over n squared, so i over n squared. And then we'll just manipulate that a little bit. So again, goodbye, pretty picture. And then this becomes the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n, again, sum from i from 1 to n of i squared over n squared. Again, not to be confused with i squared equals minus 1. That's different. And the nice thing is the n squared comes out and becomes n cubed. So limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n cubed. And then the sum from i from 1 to n of i squared. But the beautiful thing is, since this is uh, college calculus, turns out the sum of i squares has an explicit expression. So that is just as follows. Limit n goes to infinity of 1 over n cubed, again, times n times n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 over 6. And the beautiful thing is that n here cancels out, and we're left with limit n goes to infinity of n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6n squared. And if you factor out n from the numerator here, it cancels out with n squared. So in the end, we're left with 2 over 6, which is 1 third. All right, so now we are 5 points out of 10. So we kind of passed the exam, if you wish. But now let's see how to do it once you take real analysis as an undergrad. Real analysis, again, three points in that case. And this one has to do with partitions, which is just a way of subdividing 0, 1, but not necessarily with the same length. So it could be like smaller things here, larger widths here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what you get is a partition p, not like pi m, but like partition. And on each partition, so if on, on each subinterval, the only difference is before you consider the right-hand sum and the left-hand sum, but this time you consider what's called the upper sum, so UPF, 
pf simply given by choosing again the point that makes the function largest or the highest point and lpf so the lower sum again think Riemann sum but instead of choosing the left point or the right point you take the biggest point and the smallest point and what's nice is is that our integral is guaranteed to be in between those two things and in order to show that the integral is uh, one-third, what we need to show here is as follows. So let epsilon be positive. What we would like to do, we would like to find our partition that makes this infinitesimally small. So we want to find our partition p okay, such that Again, if you take upper sum and lower sum and take the sum of this, okay, then the difference between the upper sum and the lower sum is less than epsilon. So think absolute value, but this is always bigger than that. So it's fine. And, and in order to do this, the cool thing is we can simply use the same partition as before. So now, uh, given epsilon, let n be very large, in fact, such that 1 over n is less than epsilon, and be such that 1 over n is less than epsilon. So think 1 over 10,000 or something. And then let p simply be the regular partition, simply be the same partition as before. So you have 0 and 1, and you chop it off into intervals of length 1 over n. And here's the cool thing. So again, consider the function right, x squared with that partition. So 0 and 1. And the cool thing is, well, what is the upper sum? It's simply the right-hand sum. Because you see, on each subinterval, the biggest point is the right point because it's increasing. So this would be like u, pf. And what is the lower sum? Well, it's the left-hand sum. Again, not true for functions in general, but it's true for increasing functions. So literally, all we have to do, we have to calculate right-hand sum minus left-hand sum. So then u, pf minus LPF, again, it's just 1 over n times, again, 1 over n squared plus 2 over n squared, all the way up to n over n squared, minus 1 over n times, again, 0 over n squared, so 0 squared plus 1 over n squared up to n minus 1 over n squared. And the neat thing is, so this 1 over n factors out, and we actually get a telescoping sum. So this cancels out, all that stuff cancels out, up to uh, n over n squared. So we're left with simply 1 over n times 1, and 1 over n, well remember, we define n such that this is less than epsilon. So in fact, we do have that this function is called integrable, Darbu integrable. And how do you evaluate then the integral? Well, simply by choosing either UPF or LPF or any partition that you want. So, so in this case, the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared dx, that is the limit as n goes to infinity of UPF with that partition. But that's literally the same thing as the Riemann sum we calculated. Limit n goes to infinity of 1 over n, sum i from 1 to n of i over n squared, which we've calculated to be 1 third. So it's like calculus, but a bit harder. But here, where we really make sure that the function is integrable. All right, and last but not least is grad school with Lebesgue integrals. 
Last but not least, grad school, which you'll see is very, very neat because for Riemann sums and even real analysis, we focus on the inputs. Now let's focus on the outputs. So what we would like to do, again, this is the interval 0, 1, and we would like to find what's called a sequence of simple functions that kind of goes closer and closer to x squared. So simple functions, just think like step functions. So it's like constant, and then it goes up. Constant goes up in that case. But it's slightly more uh, complicated than that because we haven't done measure theory. But I do want to mention, I did a video on the Lebesgue integral on my channel. You can check it out. So again, what we would like to do, we would like to find some sequence fn of x. So want to find fn, again, kind of think step function, such that as n goes to infinity, or such that if you want for all x, x, fn of x goes to f of x, so x squared, as n goes to infinity. In other words, if we choose n to be larger and larger, which here you'll see means finer and finer, then the function actually goes to x squared. And without further ado, what is fn? Well, again, partition the interval regularly the way we did it before. And on 0, 1 over n, we define it to be 1 over n. So 1 over n on 0 and then 1 over n and then on the second interval 1 over n 2 over n it becomes 2 over n 1 over n 2 over n and generally if you have i minus 1 over n i over n it just becomes i over n i over n on i minus 1 over n i over n the right hand sum and lastly on the last interval it's just one so mm, oh should be like this sorry okay. and then it's just one on n minus one over n and also one because we have a, it's just an end point all right and let's show that in fact fn as defined as such goes to x squared and it turns out it's not a bad proof, because if you choose x at random, then x is in one of those mini intervals. And it turns out the difference between x squared and the fn is smaller than the difference between consecutive things here. And this is actually small by construction. But again, let me prove this rigorously. y, and again, fix x and n then, again, from what I said, x is a, in a mini interval. So x is in i minus 1 over n, or i over n, for some i. i. And OK, except for the case x equals 1, but that's definitely uh, the function converges to 1 at that point. And because it does it for every n. All right, then we have that. And then the nice thing is as follows. So uh, if x in this thing, then x squared so is between i minus 1 over n squared and then x squared and then i over n squared. So again, what this means is that our function x squared it squeezed between the left point so i minus 1 over n squared and i over n squared, kind of like this. And look, so what is, remember what is fn is this upper thing. So fn of x is somewhere here. And the point is, the difference between fn of x and x squared 
as mentioned, is smaller than the difference between i over n squared and i minus 1 over n squared. And it turns out this difference becomes very small as n gets large. So then, then again, absolute value of fn of x minus f of x, which by definition is just i over n squared minus x squared. By this picture, that is less than or equal to i over n squared minus i minus 1 over n squared. And this nicely simplifies, because the i squares cancel out. And I think you're left with 2i minus 1 over n squared. And it's very important that this is n squared. If it were n, then we would be in trouble. But here's the thing. So 2i over n, i is less than or equal to n. So this is less than or equal, let's say, to 2n plus 1. And 2n plus 1 over n squared, as n goes to infinity, goes to 0. And you see what's nice is this bound doesn't depend on i. So it just depends on n. So if you let n go to infinity, whoosh, it disappears. All right, very good. So what this shows is that you know this fn of x actually approximates f of x. And then what is the integral of x squared? It's just the area under this fn of x, which is just a bunch of rectangles. So in that case, the, inti like the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared dx is just the limit, as n goes to infinity, of the integrals of those simple functions. But again, literally this fn of x, they're all like little rectangles. So to find the limit, it's exactly the same thing as before. Limit n goes to infinity of base 1 over n, and then height is all those i over n squares. So the same Riemann sum as before, but it's one third. But again, why torture you with this? You know, why not just stay at the high school level? Because first of all, college level explains why this works. And also, analysis and you know, grad school, uh, they generalize this notion. Because turns out the Riemann integral is a bit in a, inadequate for harder problems, like in probability or anything. But definitely, uh, uh, those things are much nicer. And they also give you some nice intuition. I like this partition business where you have stuff getting very close together. All right, I hope you like this. If you want to see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.